Thank you. Um, Thank then you. We move indeed now to the ESHG award lecture. And we're a bit behind, so I'll move very quickly uh, and give the laudatio for this lecture. So the ESHG award is given each year to a prominent European scientist who has made important contributions to the field of human genetics. This year, the ECG award winner is Professor Wendy Bigmore. Professor Bigmore is director of the prestigious MRC Human Genetics Unit at the University of Edinburgh. She obtained an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Oxford and her PhD from the University of Edinburgh. As an independent fellow of the Lister Institute of Preventative Medicine, she used fluorescence in situ hybridization approaches to reveal that different human chromosomes have preferred positions in the nucle nucleus. In 1999, Professor Bigmore published a landmark paper entitled Differences in the Localization and Morphology of Chromosomes in the Human Nucleus in the Journal of Cell Biology, the most cited publication until now. Perhaps not by coincidence, that same year she was one of 10 young scientists awarded the $1 million James S. McDonnell Centennial Fellowship. During her career, she has investigated how individual genes are organized and packaged in the nucleus and how they move in the cell cycle and during development. She studies how this genome organization impacts gene expression by association of genes with putative long-range regulatory elements and investigates how all of this can be infected in disease. For all of this work, she uses state-of-the-art technology from live cell imaging to various chromosome confirmation capture assays. Professor Bigmore received the Tenovus Medal in 2005, is a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and a fellow of the Royal Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Academy of Medical Sciences. Professor Bigmore has also been recognized for her efforts to communicate science to young people, receiving the Royal Society of Edinburgh Inspiration Award in 2007. To this, we will now add the ESHG Award. Let me briefly read out the text that is present on the ESHG Award that is being given to Professor Bigmore. The ESHG is to recognize Professor Wendy Bigmore for her pioneering work in developing and applying innovative methods to study the structure, spatial organization, and dynamics of chromosomes in the nucleus and its effect on genome function in development and disease. This is recognized by our committee to be of major importance to our field of human genetics. I congratulate Professor Bigmore on behalf of the ESHG and look forward to her award lecture. I should have shown this picture while I was saying this, Laudatio, but that's just because I'm trying to handle everything here from the computer. The floor is yours, Professor Bigmore, for your presentation. So it's a great pleasure to be able to present this award lecture at the ESHG. This year, um, just sorry that I can't be there uh, with you in person in Berlin. So what I want to do today in my talk is address what I think is really one of the biggest challenges facing us in, in studying the human genome and understanding human genetics. And that's trying to understand function and dysfunction in the non-coding genome. So I've divided my talk into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to discuss what kind of methods we might uh, need to use and develop to assess the pathogenicity of variants in the human genome that we find in the non-coding space. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, I'm going to turn more to the functional uh, role of the non-coding genome and whether the three-dimensional organisation of the genome has a role, and particularly in the way that enhances function. So although we have the ability to, of course, sequence the whole human genome and sequence millions of genomes, so millions of people and, and different tissues and tumours, we still do not understand the function of most of that genome. A large proportion of it, of course, is made of repetitive sequences. But even in the unique portion of the human genome, a lot of the uh, genome is non-coding. So the uh, protein coding part, the part we really understand, uh, uh, is, a, is a tiny proportion, 2% or so. And yet, we know, for example, from genome-wide association studies for where the variants are in our genome that give us uh, different susceptibilities to common diseases and traits, that much of that genetic variation lies uh, outside of the coding region, uh, lies in the non-coding region of the genome, including the introns of genes, but also at large distances from any annotated gene in the genome, up to a million base pairs or so. Uh, and the thinking is that these variants lie within regulatory elements in the genome that control uh, the expression of our genes in time and place. Uh, and we call these uh, elements enhancers. 
So we know that the regulatory landscape of genes uh, and then the enhancers that control their expression can be very, very complicated. These two are my favorite examples, uh, which may lie towards the extreme of complexity because these are developmental gene loci, the PAC6 lockers on the top, sonic hedgehog on the bottom here, that uh, encode very important factors for proper uh, embryonic development. Uh, and encode and, and the genes that are regulated in these loci uh, play very important roles in developing a, nar- a large number of different tissues in development. Uh, for other genes, enhance the landscape might be simpler. But these are particularly intriguing, and I th- think they serve uh, to illustrate the point well. Uh, so if we look up here at the PAC6 locus, uh, in over 500 kilobases, a half a megabase of the human genome or so, we already know of at least uh, 30 different enhancers. Uh, which are all these coloured uh, uh, ovals here, that control the expression of the PAC6 gene at different times and places in early development, uh, including, for example, uh, during eye development in blue here, uh, but in also in different parts of brain development. So these regulatory elements can be embedded within the gene itself, in the introns. They can be located far upstream of the gene in this non-coding space here, but they can also be located downstream of the gene, in the introns of other genes, such as this gene ELP4, which has got nothing to do uh, with PAC6 itself. It's a housekeeping gene. Uh, similarly for Sonic Hedgehog here, Sonic uh, encodes a very important embryonic morphogen uh, expressed in uh, many different times and places in development. And again, its regulatory landscape is, is complex with only about uh, 18 or so enhancers discovered so far, I'm sure there'd be more to be found. Uh, but these enhancers are located in the intron of the gene, uh, and upstream in this large uh, gene desert, uh, and again, including in the introns of unrelated genes here, including uh, this gene here, uh, LMBR1. So we know that, dis- that, that disruption of heart enhancers can cause uh, human genetic disease, uh, and in particular Mendelian disease, and, and these Disorders have been uh, termed as a group collectively enhanced seropathies. Uh, and I think these uh, instances are very instructive for us in trying to, in allowing us to understand how enhancers do and don't work uh, and how they can go wrong. So, for example, uh, in these uh, examples here, this is not a comprehensive list at all. It's just giving you a flavor of the different aberrations we know about enhancers in Mendelian disease. Of course, enhancers don't work. If they're deleted, they're not there. Uh, And here's some examples of small deletions in the human genome, a long way, up to a million base pairs away from the genes that they control. And when these enhancers are deleted, the target genes fail to be expressed in specific times and places. So, for example, uh, in this example here from SOX9 lockers, small deletions remove enhancers that control expression of SOX9 during uh, particular uh, times and places of chondrogenesis, resulting in this. Pierre Aban sequence, which is a bowing of the long bones and cleft lip palate. So these enhancers can work at great distance, uh, but probably not much beyond a megabase or so. These elements are also dosage sensitive. So deletion of these elements also produce disorders. And here's an example, uh, for example, again at SOX9, uh, this time uh, a closer enhancer, only 600 kilobases away from the gene, duplication of which uh, gives inappropriate expression of SOX9 during gonadal differentiation. So we know SOX9 is a very important transcription factor for determining the fate of the developing gonad. And here, this duplication results in a sexual dimorphism. So these elements can work at great distance, but they are distance limited. So chromosomal inversions, for example, which increase the genomic separation between enhancer and its target gene. The proper community gene. Here's a nice example uh, from Sonic Hedgehog. Or they can uh, place an enhancer next to an inappropriate gene so that you get ectopic gene activation. So enhancers can work at great distance in cis, they do not work in trans. So translocations that separate uh, the continuity of an enhancer and its target promoter also break the system. Here's another example from Pierre Aban's sequence where a translocation has separated uh, that distant enhancer from its target gene, SOX9. Uh, and then last, but by no means least, of course, point mutations in these elements 
also give, can also give rise to Mendelian disease. So these can be loss of function mutations. So here's an example here from Sonic Hedgehog, where a single nucleotide change uh, in a four brain enhancer, about half a million base pairs upstream of Sonic Hedgehog, disturbs the binding site for a transcription factor 63, which is known to be important to activate Sonic Hedgehog in the brain. So uh, this single nucleotide change results in a very severe Mendelian disorder, holoprosencephaly, cephaly, so midline uh, brain defect. Another example for an intriguing example from Sonic Hedgehog uh, is, is a gain of function mutations in enhancers. Uh, in, in this particular enhancer called ZRS, ZRS is the famous limb enhancer for Sonic Hedgehog, loca located a million base pairs away from Sonic, located in the intron of another gene, LMBR, which is not has nothing to do with sonic hedgehog regulation. And here, these single nucleotide changes are, create extra binding sites for a family of transcription factors called the ETS family, again, which are known to be involved in limb development. Here's an example from PAC6, which is even more intriguing and gives you a glimpse into the complexity of developmental gene regulation. It's a single nucleotide change in an enhancer downstream of PAC6, which changes the binding site for PAC6, PAC6 is a transcription factor. So this is disrupting an autoregulatory uh, feedback. And these aberrations can be, in, these enhanced point mutations can be uh, every bit as severe as loss of function mutations for the coding region gene. And so this is work I'm going to describe briefly uh, from a senior postdoc in my lab, Shipp Rabatia. So here's this example of uh, this autoregulatory PAC6 binding site in this eye enhancer of Sonic uh, for, for PAC6 here. And you can see the phenotype here is every bit as severe as a loss of function uh, mutation within the coding region of PAC6 itself. So it's quite clear that uh, single nucleotide changes within regulatory elements can cause severe human genetic disease. We don't know the prevalence of this at the moment because, of course, we haven't really been looking up till now. We've really been mainly studying the exome in the context of, of disease. But I think we will start to uncover as we do more whole genome sequencing, uh, particularly for de novo mutations. We hopefully, we'll discover many more variants which might be uh, mutations within enhancers responsible for disease pathology. But of course, once we're outside the coding region of genes, we no longer have a genetic code to allow us to interpret what a single nuclear ch change might mean functionally, what it might do to uh, the sequence of a protein, the ability of a, a messenger RNA to be translated into a protein, for example. So we're, we're a bit in the dark when we come to these variants. So we, we need to build up knowledge about how enhancers work and the transcription factors bind them, but we also need probably to have experimental methods that might allow us to test the pathogenicity uh, of, of mutations in, in distal enhancers. So that's what SHIPRA has been uh, trying to set up. So, so this is uh, another example from PAX6 here. So what we've done with our cohort of aniridia patients, where for, for the vast majority, there are indeed uh, mutations within the PAX6 gene itself, uh, but we've excluded those. So we've taken the exome negative uh, uh, aniridia patients, and then SHIPRA has resequenced the known enhancers for PAC6 to look for de novo uh, variants. Uh, and she's found already in the first 20 or so patients, she's looked at four of these. Uh, these, are, these are here. This is the one you've already seen, the Simon mutation here. Uh, and each of them is in a different enhancer for PAC6. These four here, all in the same large uh, intron of this gene, ALP4. Uh, these are all eye enhancers. Um, so these are conserved residues that are changed between human and mouse. So they look like they might, might be pathogenic. They're de novo, so that suggests they're pathogenic. But we, we need some experimental evidence that these changes uh, in sequence change the function of these regulatory elements. So how are we going to do this? So we don't think it's possible for a gene like PAP6, which is regulated so tightly during development in both time and space, to do this in a cell culture system. We think the uh, assays have to be in vivo. And so uh, the assay system that SHIPRA has set up uh, is uh, to, is using the zebrafish, Daniel Rowley. Uh, it, it's a very beautiful system, a reporter system in which we can pit two enhancers against each other in the same cells of the same fish at the same time. So uh, what she has, has done is she has one enhancer driving GFP, uh, the second, the variant of that enhancer, the putative mutant enhancer, driving cherry off the same uh, plasmid separated from each other by a very strong insulator, so we know, and we've shown there's no crosstalk between these uh, two. 
Uh, and then th this co these constructs are integrated into uh, a single site in the zebrafish genome, which we know uh, doesn't impose any position effects on the reporter construct. So uh, to give you proof of principle that this is a, a, a feasible approach to uh, score through uh, enhanced variants that show up uh, in human genetics, uh, this is the uh, activity of the mouse uh, simo uh, in enhancer in the developing zebrafish. You can see at 48 hours after fertilization in the zebrafish, this element drives uh, activity uh, in the developing uh, hindbrain uh, of, of the fish and the di diencephalon of the fish and also the developing lens. Uh, and at 72 hours, that uh, regulatory activity has, has resolved down to just a driving expression within the lens, which of course fits with a, a, an eye disorder. So now if we pits within the same uh, reporter, the wild type cymo, human cymo element against the putative mutant version of the uh, element that we, we detected in a patient with aniridia. And here wild types driving cherry, mutants driving uh, green. Uh, and here we sort the colors around, wild type drives green, mutant drives red. I hope you can see at 72 hours at this time point here, uh, in this fish embryo here, you can see the developing eyes are red, not green. So the wild type elements are active, the mutant is not. And here in this color swap experiment, the developing eyes are green and they're not, there's no red signal there. So I think this is a, it looks like to be a, a promising assay for uh, determining whether a single nucleotide change in enhancer uh, affects the function of that element in space. Uh, we can also pick up temporal differences uh, in activity as well in, in putative mutant enhancers. This is a, a known mutation in another so in a sonic hedgehog enhancer, this uh, SBE2 element that I told you about earlier, actually. This is the single nucleotide change, C to T, that ablates the 6-3 binding site. This was discovered by Doug, Doug Epstein many years ago, uh, and, and he showed the effect, actually the effect of this enhancer uh, using mouse transgenic assays. So here we're, we're showing uh, the activity of these uh, variant enhancers, wild-type and putative mutants. Um, uh, over time in developing zebrafish using our reporter assay. Uh, so at early time points, 36 hours, uh, we see expression of both the wild type version and the mutant uh, version. We can't really tell them apart at these early time points in the developing brain. Uh, but at 50 hours, we can see that the mutant enhancer is no longer capable of driving expression, whereas the wild type enhancer is really ramping up its ability to drive expression. So here we're really picking up exquisite temporal uh, differences. But again, uh, this is, seems to be proof that these, this variant is indeed probably pathogenic. So the conclusions of what I've told you so far, I think, are that, that certainly mutations in enhancers contribute to Mendelian disease. Uh, it remains to be determined how prevalent that will be. It will be very exciting to determine that. We, we believe that mutations in enhancers need to be functionally assessed in the correct biological context, preferably in vivo. And, and at least for the kind of development enhancers we're studying here, the zebrafish proves to be a, a good vertebrate system for quantitatively assaying uh, enhancer activity in vivo in a dynamic uh, fashion uh, in both uh, time and space. So could we apply the, se the same kind of approach to identify, identify causative variants uh, in common disease, so more common alleles? Of course, uh, it's, it's easier to build up an argument that a variant is functional when you're doing, uh, dealing with rare alleles uh, with large effect sizes causing, causing Mendelian disease. Much more of a challenge uh, to ascertain what the functional consequence is of a common variant that has a small effect size uh, so, and, and is causing uh, different susceptibility to common disease or, or a particular trait. But I think the same principles probably apply. And I'm going to give you an example of, of an effort that's ongoing uh, in the lab in collaboration with Veronique Vital's lab uh, to so the trait we've chosen to study here is the, the thickness of the central cornea. So it's another eye trait. Uh, it's, it's known that this is a highly quantitative trait. It's uh, a nice trait to be measuring because it deals with the tissue, the cornea of the human eye, which is very simple. This is a simple three-layered uh, structure uh, with epithelial cells on the outside, endothelial cells on the inside, and there's a large, thick stroma here, uh, made of collagen fibrils uh, uh, populated by a cell type called keratocytes. 
uh, and, and, and indeed this stroma constitutes most of the thickness of the cornea. So uh, this is the variability of corneal thickness uh, in the uh, normal population here. It, it can be highly variable. I happen to know I'm on the thick side over here. Um, and on the very thin side, uh, once you get down to, to uh, less than half a millimeter thickness, um, you can develop uh, susceptibility to a trait called uh, keratoconus, which, uh, where the cornea is so thin that it tends to become uh, deformed. And indeed, this is a, a large cause of, of referrals to uh, ophthalmic uh, clinics. And we know that there's, there is a, a strong genetic component to kerat keratoconus. Uh, the underlying genes have not uh, been determined uh, yet. So uh, many, many groups around the world have done GWAS for central corneal thickness and for keratoconus, actually, uh, and, and other assays of, of corneal function. Uh, here's your typical Manhattan plots, uh, which are replicated in, in many different uh, ancestries. Uh, and I'm going to focus on one of these, this high peak here, uh, which is labeled here ZNF469. Uh, and here it's uh, replicated here in another study here. So typically of these GWAS hits, the, the lead SNPs don't lie anywhere near a gene. They lie in this 300 kilobase gene desert here. So if we zoom on this region here, the, the block of LD, like it's disequilibrium, where the lead slips are no, located here, sits uh, between these two genes, uh, band P over here, and ZNF469 uh, over here. So the first question we always want to ask in these kind of situations is, which do we think is the target gene where these uh, common uh, alleles exert their effect? Um, so for this particular case, we've taken an educated guess uh, guided by, indeed, Mendelian disease, because uh, it is known that severe loss of function uh, mutations within this gene ZF469 uh, cause uh, a Mendelian uh, syndrome called brittle cornea syndrome, where the cornea is so thin uh, that it's completely sclerotic and dysfunctional. And indeed, there are other connective tissue uh, disorders uh, in brittle cornea syndrome. So we think that's pretty strong evidence that uh, the alleles in here, uh, which are linked to corneal thickness, are, are exerting their effect on expression of ZN469. So um, what kind of tissue to assay this in? Well, in this case, we do, th we think cell, cell line, we might have found a cell line, which would be an appropriate um, cell line to study. Because we know uh, most of the thickness of the cornea is in the stroma and the cell type that's in there is the keratocytes, we were lucky enough to obtain uh, primary cell lines from the human cornea representing the epithelium and the keratocytes. And indeed, it's only the keratocytes that express ZNS, ZNF469, what we think is the target gene. So using those cell lines, we've gone uh, in to this region and examined the chromatin in the region using a method called ATAC-seq. I'm not going to go into the method. It's well used in the field. Uh, it's a lovely assay for detecting disruption of nucleosomes caused by the binding of transcription factors. And of course, when an enhancer is active, what's happening is that transcription factors are binding there and excluding uh, nucleosomes. So they, that can be picked up very nicely. So here within this LD block, so these are two replicates of data from the keratocytes, the corneal keratocytes, and this is two replicates of data from the corneal epithelial cells, the, the cell type that we don't think is relevant to this trait. So you can see there are peaks in common between the two cell types in this LD block, but we've ignored those because they are in common, and we know it's only these cell types that express so they're 469. But over here, I think you can see two strong peaks that are keratocyte specifics and are absent. For, from the corneal epithelium. So these look promising. So well, then what we've done with these is we've taken them in vivo into the zebrafish and taken the two haplotypes of these peaks, the one associated with thick cornea and the one associated thin cornea, put them into Shipra's reporter assay and competed them against each other to ask about their regulatory activity. Uh, and what we're able to see here uh, is so here the, the, the allele associated with thick cornea is in green, the thin cornea is in red. Uh, and in the developing zebrafish, you can see in, in parts of the developing brain, for example, the forebrain here, uh, there seems to be equal activity coming from the two alleles. But in the developing eye, 
you've got much more activity coming out of the green allele, which is the thick cornea allele, than the red allele, which is the thin cornea allele. So we think we're able to pick up quantitative differences in activity here, uh, which may relate to the underlying trait. So I think that's looking promising. So for sure, variants in enhancers are going to contribute to human di- uh, to common disease. GWAS tells us that. Just like for Mendelian disease, they, they need to be assessed in the correct biological context, be that in vitro, in, cell li- in the right cell line, in the right conditions, or in vivo. And again, for some uh, systems, zebrafish may be a good system for really quantitative assays, uh, enhancer variants, uh, longitudinally in vivo. So you can really f- uh, follow their activity uh, in time and in response to different challenges, for example. So I think this provides a pathway from which we can start to get traction on understanding which variants enhancers are, uh, have some functional pathogenic effect in human biology. So now I want to turn to the second major question uh, I want to address in my talk, and it's the one that really fascinates me most as a cell biologist. And that's how on earth do these bits of the non-coding genome act to regulate uh, the expression of their target genes in such an exquisite spatial and temporal manner, manner from such ridiculously large genomic distances, a million base pairs, and in, in ridiculous genomic contexts, like stuck in the intron of an irrelevant gene. I think this is just a fascinating question. And of course, people have been thinking about this for a very long time. Uh, we've been studying enhancers in mammalian cells since the 1970s. Uh, and various models have been put forward, uh, all of which may be true in some settings. We don't have a universal model for how enhancers work. Um, Some of the uh, early studies on enhancers that were very close to their target genes have suggested a very linear kind of tracking model in which the machinery, the transcription factors and the transcription machinery that's recruited at the enhancers then just travels down the intervening chromatin uh, until it reaches the target promoter. So I do think that's a very feasible method, uh, model for um, uh, close enhancers. I don't think it, it doesn't seem very feasible for an enhancer that's located a million base pairs away uh, inside another gene and with another irrelevant, irrelevant gene in between it and the target gene. And so therefore people have been thinking, particularly for the more long distance enhancers, of more of models that encompass the 3D genome in which somehow the chromatin folds over such that the distant enhancer sits spatially close to the target promoter it's going to regulate. So that's a very appealing model and still probably very relevant to to, to study. The other big change in our understanding of 3D genome and how enhancers might work within that context is the realisation from methods such as um, HI-C that our genome is organized into these structures called topologically associated domains that are revealed by high C methods into these uh, triangular straight stripe uh, shaped context contact matrices plots. Uh, so these plots just say that all the sequences in this bit of the tu- gen- human genome here like to interact with each other much more than they do like to interact with the sequences in the neighboring triangle over here, even though, for example, genomically, in linear distance, these sequences are closer than these sequences over here. So we call these top tad boundaries here. Um, and the real advance in the field over the last few years uh, has come from the realize that these real, realization that these structures arise by a process called loop extrusion. Loop extrusion is d- driven by uh, the complex called cohesin, it's an ATPase. Uh, uses the energy of ATP hydrolysis, it captures chromatin, moves along uh, our genome, uh, entrapping the chromatin as it goes uh, to make this topologically associated domain, and then stopping, uh, being blocked in further extrusion when it hits these roadblocks in the genome, which are sites of a binding for this zinc finger protein called CTCF. Uh, and, the, and the motifs for CTCF have to be in a particular orientation to be roadblocks to cohesin. So beautiful experiments in cell biology have shown us that's the the method. Landscape for complex genes like Hedgehog, his site with all its uh, 17 or 18 enhancers. Even though these enhancers spread over a million base pairs of genomic space, they're all contained within the same TAD as the gene itself. So this smells as though these structures might have to do with something, uh, have something to do with long range gene regulation. Uh, and indeed, uh, 
people have been discussing this and suggesting that indeed perhaps one of the functions of this kind of structure in our genome, these TADs, is to allow distant enhancers to contact their target genes because they're in the same associating domain and to prevent ectopic activation of a gene, such as sonic hedgehog, for example, by enhancers for other genes that are located in the adjacent TAD. So this makes a lot of sense as a model. We would like to test it. Uh, so we decided to test this at the Sonic Hedgehog Locus, and this is a collaboration between my lab uh, and that of uh, the lab of Bob Hill uh, in Edinburgh, who I've been uh, collaborating with for a long time. Bob's worked in is a mouse geneticist who works in Sonic Hedgehog, and indeed was the discoverer of the limb enhancer ZRS. So, um, how do you test this model? Uh, well, you could destroy loop extrusion by taking out cohesin, for example, but then you just take it out across the whole genome and in fact the cells are not happy and they will eventually die and, and you disrupt all gene regulation. So it's very hard to, to look at direct consequences. So we decided we want to be more precise and not disrupt the whole genome, but really only disrupt uh, the tad that Sonic Hedgehog sits in. Um, so Laura Lettuce in Bob's lab decided to do this by using CRISPR-Cas9 gene uh, genome editing to take out the CTCF sites that make the boundaries of the Sonic Hedgehog tad. And in fact, we also took out some internal CTCF sites as well. Uh, so we took these out uh, homozygously in mouse embryonic stem cells and also in mouse embryos. Uh, so uh, do they do what we think they should do through the loop extrusion model, and the answer is yes. Uh, I'm only going to show you the data in this talk for, for the for purposes of time for site one, which makes this left-hand boundary of the sonic hedgehog tad here. Uh, the, data, the, the, the work is published, so you can go and see the data for the rest. Uh, but the ultimate conclusion for all the five sites that we looked at is the same. So this is our our. our uh, C matrix uh, contacts uh, in wild type mouse embryonic stem cells. Ignore the white lines. Uh, they come from repetitive elements where we, where we actually can't map the data. Uh, so here's the left hand boundary here. Uh, here's Sonic Hedgehog here, and here's all its enhancers through to here. Here's the limb enhancer, and here's the right hand boundary. So now this is the same uh, experiment, but done in mouse ES cells where we've taken out site one, the left hand boundary in both alleles. So I hope you can see here the loss of this left hand boundary. So these strong, this red stripe here is gone. The new boundary is formed here at this CTCF site two, which is this side of Sonic Hedgehog. So it sits in between Sonic Hedgehog and its enhancers here. If you find that hard, and, and, and sorry, and, con, and con, consequently, Sonic Hedgehog now sits in this tad over here, not this one. And you can see here this red line here that's not there, uh, where Sonic Hedgehog is picking up interactions with the genome over here. Uh, if you find that hard to follow, here's the difference matrix. So blue is a loss of interactions, red is a gain. So you can see Sonic losing interactions with all the sequences in its own tad and gaining interactions with the tad over here. So uh, we have messed up the structure of the Sonic Hedgehog tag. We've, we've perturbed it and altered the boundary in particular. Uh, so what uh, can we verify this in another way? So we've also verified this by imaging, by going in with sequences within the Sonic Hedgehog TAD, three sequences here spread across the TAD. You can see in wild-type cells, even though they're spread over a million base pairs, they're very cl closely associated with each other. And here in the mutant cells, you can hope you can appreciate the spatial separation. So consistent with what we see with this molecular method. So because we made animals from these mutant cells, we were able to go into specific tissues where we know that the distinct sonic hedgehog enhancers are active and ask what, what's this disruption done, done to the proximity between sonic hedgehog uh, and the enhancer. So here we're looking at the limb enhancer of sonic hedgehog. Uh, which is active in this small proportion of cells called the zone of polarizing activity in the developing mouse limb bud over on the posterior margin here. So we had published many, uh, several years ago that in this patch of cells, and not over here on the other side of the developing limb bud, the anterior side, where sonic is not activated, we can see a very high frequency of spatial co-localization of sonic hedgehog and its limb enhancer even though the enhancers are a million pace pairs away. So very consistent with the loop we thought at the time with the looping model of how distant enhancers work. Uh, and we don't see that high frequency uh, over on the anterior side. So now when we do the same experiment in the developing mouse limb buds of a mouse which has lost both copies of CTCF site one, we can see consistent with disruption of the TAD and this loss of interactions between Sonic Hedgehog and the ZRS here, uh, a, a drastic loss of this spatial proximity of Sonic and the limb enhancer. 
So the million dollar question therefore is what have we done to sonic hedgehog regulation in these mutant mice? Uh, and the answer was by staining for sonic hedgehog during mouse uh, embryonic development and indeed allowing the embryos to be born. Uh, the answer was we had no detectable effect on sonic hedgehog at all. Even though we disrupted 3D organization, even though we disrupted uh, the proximity of a known enhancer to sonic hedgehog, we found the patterns of sonic hedgehog uh, expression during development in both the brain here and in the limb bud here was identical between the wild type and the homozygous mutant mice. We couldn't detect any significant difference in the levels of sonic hedgehog either. Uh, and uh, even more uh, compellingly, these uh, mice were born, normal Mendelian ratios, the homozygous mutant mice look fine, no overt phenotype, run around the cage, normal limbs, and reproduce normally. So we're unable to detect uh, an effect on sonic hedgehog. So all the enhancers for sonic hedgehog to be, seem to be working just fine, even though we have disrupted uh, somewhat the sonic hedgehog tag. Um, we also asked about whether maybe sonic is now picking up ectopic expression, uh, because now it's sitting in this tad over here where there's enhancers for engrailed and canopy one, which are expressed at the midbrain hindbrain boundary here, quite distinct from the pattern of sonic hedgehog expression in the brain. But in our mutant mice, we find normal sonic hedgehog expression and no uh, evidence that it's picking up the activity of the enhancers, which is now making increased contact score. So uh, it's quite clear that the simple model uh, that, that TADs are there to completely can allow, so to be essential to allow um, and genes and their enhancers to communicate and to uh, absolutely stop ectopic uh, activation of genes by enhancers elsewhere in the genome uh, is, is not true. It's not to say that TADs don't have any role in enhancer function. I think they may well do, and particularly the loop extrusion process, but it's much more complicated than we thought. So a lot more work to be done there. Uh, and as I showed you for the for the limb uh, experiment, uh, our data also suggests that even though we could see what looked like looping between the sonic hedgehog limb enhancer and the gene in the right tissue at the right time, when we disrupted that in the mutant mice, it didn't have any effect on limb bud expression. It didn't have any effect, overt effect on sonic hedgehog expression in the limb. That limb enhancer was still working just fine, uh, even though it was no longer spatially close very, very close to the enhancer. So that suggested that the, the looping model isn't necessarily the answer to all long range uh, enhancer regulation either. And indeed, uh, we had come to a similar conclusion uh, in a separate study, studying sonic hedgehog, not in vivo, as I've just described to you, uh, but, but actually uh, ex vivo in mouse embryonic stem cells. So Neza ben, uh, ben Abdalo, when she was a PhD student in the lab, decided to study uh, the activation of sonic hedgehog by its neuron enhancers during ES cell differentiation to neural progenitor cells. Uh, and, 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 and what she saw by imaging when she did that was that during the activation of sonic by uh, the neural enhancers, she saw an increased spatial separation uh, between the gene and the enhancer, exactly the opposite to what we were predicting uh, from the looping model. So she decided to investigate this more mechanistically using this system because it's, because it's more tractable than doing in vivo experiments. Uh, and indeed, she, we've decided to tackle it using a system in which we don't rely on enhancers to be activated by the normal transcription machinery uh, in the cell, but that we take charge of the system uh, by, uh, by using synthetic transcription factors that we've designed ourselves. And I'll explain to you how these work. Uh, so sonic hedgehog is normally not expressed in mouse embryonic stem cells. But we can activate it at will by making our own transcription factors that will bind, for example, to the sonic hedgehog uh, promoter itself or to some of the enhancers of sonic hedgehog. Uh, and we make these transcription factors from a, a designed uh, DNA binding domain that comes from this family of proteins called the TAL effectors, uh, which are transcription factors from plant pathogens. Uh, so within uh, this domain of these proteins, there are two amino acids which uh, you can vary, and depending what the amino acids are, uh, that this make a sequence-specific um, DNA binding protein that will recognize a, a unique 12 or 14 million genome. Uh, 
Uh, and we turn these into transcription factors by fusing them to a well-known artificial transcriptional activation domain. It comes from a virus, actually, called VP16. We make multiples of those. So, so this works really well. So this is mouse embryonic stem cells, just with an empty vector, just with EGFP on the end here. And then these are um, cells in which we are targeting this uh, transcription factor to the motor sonic hedgehog. So that works nicely. We can activate sonic. Uh, and here, in these experiments here, we're targeting uh, our artificial transcription factors either to this enhancer here, SBE6, uh, or this enhancer here, SBE2, which is half a million base pairs away from Sonic Hedgehog. So we can do synthetic activation from a distance from half a million base pairs away from this, uh, using this method, recapitulating how uh, natural enhancers naturally act in their uh, environment. Um, so we can show that uh, the Increased uh, separation between an enhanced and proximity, so the opposite of what we would expect by looping, results from in, uh, activating enhancers, not from activating promoters. So here we're using imaging to measure the distance between uh, enhancer and promoter in a system in which here we've activated Sonic Hedgehog by putting the transcription factor directly on the gene promoter. And you'll see in these violin plots here, the distances, that nothing much happens in terms of 3D genome reorganization when you do that. But here... We've done, uh, we've activated the gene by putting the synthetic factor on the distant enhancers, either uh, SBE6 or SBE2. And we can show that that increased separation and enhancer and promoter depends on the activator, because here in this experiment, we've taken the activator out of the binding proteins and we've just got the tau and, and then the, the structure collapses back down. So this decreased proximity seems to result from enhancer activation. What's causing the increased uh, separation of enhancers and promoters? Um, we think it may be a, a post-translational modification of either chromatin or another factor bound uh, to this region of the genome uh, called polyADP ribose polymerase, uh, polyADP ribose. So polyADP ribosylation is, is known to be involved in transcriptional regulation. It's more commonly studied in the area of DNA repair. But uh, we, we demonstrated a role for the enzyme that deposits this post-translational modification, polyADP ribose polymerase, by uh, directing PARP directly to the sonic hedgehog promoter or to the distant enhancers of sonic hedgehog. So here you can see we can recapitulate that separation of the enhancer and the promoter in mouse embryonic stem cells by directing not a transcription factor but by PARP1 to the enhancer, and we can show that depends on the catalytic activity of this, of this enzyme by introducing point mutations into the fusion protein. Uh, and there we, we no longer see the collapse, the, the, the change in structure there. Um, and we can show that this uh, phenocopy is what goes on during mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation, where I showed you before, we have this unexpected uh, increase in distance between the enhancer and the sonic major promoter uh, when we differentiate ES cells to MP, uh, neural progenitor cells. Now, when we treat those neural progenitor cells with the laparib, which is a competitive inhibitor of PARP, uh, we collapse the structure back down. So what's going on here? And, and the, 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 the short answer is we don't know yet, but, but here's some uh, insight into the way we're thinking about this. So it has been sh uh, shown by many groups that um, polyADP ribose, the post-translational modification we're looking at here, has uh, properties of being a very good scaffold for a biophysical uh, transition in, uh, that can occur in cells as, as well as in, in liquid uh, called phase separation. So uh, this can be seeded by uh, intrinsically disordered proteins or, or, or uh, other molecules with multivalent surfaces, such, such as polyADP ribose. Um, and it's a way in which, in, in a homogeneous liquid, you can start to create different co concentrations of different factors at different places in the liquid, in different phases. Uh, we know that many of the factors that bind to enhancers and are involved in transcription regulation are substrates for modification by PARP. Uh, and indeed, uh, over the last few years, the transcription field has been moving towards the idea that transcriptional regulation in cells, and I've taken this image from one of Rick Young's paper, occurs through a phase separation mechanism. So in this model from Rick, Rick's paper here, he's drawn a gene here together with its enhancers here. And you can see that the enhancers aren't looped to the target gene promoter, rather that the enhancers are are shaped around a liquid-liquid droplet formed by phase separation. And within this droplet or transcriptional hub, 
Uh, you can accumulate very high concentrations of transcription factors, coactivators, uh, RNA polymerase, for example. And then biochemistry and mass action can drive transcription of the target gene, which is also associated with the same hub. So I think this is a, a really exciting model that, that requires further testing. And very similar, I think, to the model that we put forward uh, in NASA's paper here uh, to explain what we were seeing through this increased separation of uh, genes and their enhancers. So we think that PARP probably has a role in creating a phase-separated liquid droplet here uh, that pushes the enhancer and the promoter apart uh, so that they're both circling, uh, encircling the same transcriptional hub that begins to accumulate high uh, concentrations of transcription factors, coactivators, etc. So I think they're very similar models. Uh, very hard to test, but that's certainly the way that we're we're going. Uh, so the conclusions from from this part of the talk are that the, to, to date the relationship between TADS and gene regulation still remains unclear. It's a really fascinating area of cell biology and requires further investigation. And again, I, I would hope that human genetics would start to provide insight in here. We, we, we should start to find, for example, mutations of the CTCF sites that create that, that are at TAD boundaries as, as being causative of, of human disorders. Um, in terms of how enhancers work from a distance, we still are not sure. I don't probably think there isn't a mechanism. I think there are probably several mechanisms at play, depending on the context of the enhancer. Uh, and we don't think that a simple looping mechanism can account for all enhancer communication. And we think that enhancer communication seems to be integrated with this fascinating uh, emerging area of cell biology, uh, which uh, relates to phase separation and the formation of transcriptional hubs. So, uh, I'm going to end the formal presentation there. And of course, I just want to end by really thanking uh, the people in my lab who did the work and, and my wonderful collaborators without whom this would not be possible. Uh, so the work on Sonic Hedgehog has been a long-term collaboration between my lab uh, and Bob Hill's lab. Uh, and the work on uh, central cornea thickness uh, and, and the eye defects in human disease is a collaboration between Shipra in my lab and Veronique Vitar's lab. Uh, and I'd like to thank NASA as well, who did the phase separation work and is now postdoc in Heidelberg. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Bigmore, for this fascinating talk. I should perhaps now just pause for a moment to have the virtual applause, because that's what we normally get at conferences. and. Uh, I'm sure that at the end of the, uh, the, let's say, after the questions, we'll see on the chat lots of uh, applause coming by. But unfortunately, you'll have to, to miss that and just imagine it in your in your room in, in Edinburgh. I will. <laughs> so a really fascinating lecture on 3D gene architecture and, express, uh, and its effect on gene expression regulation. Um, we've had a little bit of technical challenges with questions coming in on different chats. Um, but... Uh, I have a question here from Alex Hoyshen. He says, do you think a single point mutation can disrupt the CTCF site and have an effect? Or is it the redundancy in CTCF sites compensating for this? That, that's a very good question. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. In, in principle, um, yes, it could, it could do if it was the right residue, uh, okay. critical recognition site for CTCF in a motif which is in the right orientation. Uh, and some CTCF site mutations have been reported in cancer cells and cancer cells and been inferred to be have a role in disease mechanisms. Um, but I think what, what I'm really looking for is the critical evidence that a single CTCF motif mutation can cause a human genetic disease. That's right. And so far, a lot of work has indeed been done more on C and V's probably than on point mutations. So that's, that's yeah. But yeah. The increased genome sequencing will we'll get there. That's um, what I'm hoping for, yeah. Yes, and, and I fully understand. Um, one question from Dr. Turner. How conserved are these distant enhancer sequencers? Uh, very good question. Um, in general, for the more complex development enhancers, they're very well conserved. Um, so you can see it at the sequence level, for example, between the human and the mouse uh, enhancers. Uh, and even when the primary sequence doesn't look very conserved, there's a functional conservation. So we can't often find uh, the uh, homologue of a human enhancer in the zebrafish genome. But when we test the human enhancer in the zebrafish, the organism can recognize that element and treat it appropriately. So there's a lot of functional conservation. There's some primary sequence conservation. For simpler enhancers, for example, those bound by nuclear hormone receptors, 
that allow genes to be responsive uh, very rapidly to physiological cues. Um, these short motifs can be very um, divergent in evolution. So we, we did publish a study a few years ago where we looked at glutacort glutocorticoid receptor binding sites and enhances in macrophages and the response of macrophages to glutocorticoids. And there, although the transcriptional program between the human and mouse macrophages was rather similar, when we looked at where the binding sites of the glutocorticoid receptor were relative to some of those early responding genes, uh, these enhanced elements had moved around in the genome. So they weren't necessarily in the same place in the human mouse genome. So some are very conserved, some it seem much more plastic. Perhaps a question that makes no sense, but just that came up uh, in my mind listening to the previous talk as well. Um, do you think that single cell technologies can help you to look at, let's say, variation in gene expression regulation between cells? Is that something that, that can, can help to unravel? And is that possible with the technologies that you are now using? Or Yeah, I, th I think that's a very interesting question. and certainly something where we're certainly thinking about integrating the kinds of things we do with the kinds of things that we've talked about in terms of spatial transcriptomics. And of course, imaging is inherently a single cell assay, uh, in single allele assay even. So you can look at the two alleles in a, in a single cell. Um, so uh, that's something for the future. Obviously, the chromosome confirmation capture methodologies are more challenging in single cells. They have, they have been published, but the data are very sparse and are harder to interpret. But yes, I think the two fields will, will come together. Yeah. Thank you very much and congratulations again with the ESG Awards. I don't know whether you have received already the award. I did actually. It came to my house, my special courier in a very right. lovely blue box. Uh, do, you have, do you have it next to you or not? I've got it on the stairs. I can run away and get it. No, that's <laughs> all right. You, <laughs> we, but, we are rather sparse on time. So let's yeah. leave it for now. But, but indeed, if you, if you can post something on Twitter, that would be wonderful. I will do. All right. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Joris. Thank you to the committee. And thank you for organizing such a great conference. Thank you very much.